Praise the Lord. That was a jingle. They didn't just sing like they did the other time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think you are clapping your hand just to say that we thank you for the journey you took from Ajegunle to this place, but that was poor. We're going to rise up to pray, everybody. Stand up and we're going to pray. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer tonight. That the Lord will reach out to your heart. And that the word of God will enrich your soul tonight. That the Lord will open your eyes to see and to behold great, wondrous, wonderful things out of his word. Open your mouth and pray. That the study tonight will bless your soul. Explain interpret, reveal the word of truth unto you. The shady areas of your life. The things to be confused about in the past. That the Lord will open them to you as we study tonight. Great, great time for the Lord. Great revelation of his truth that he wants to make clear to you that Jesus and the Holy Spirit will be a teacher as well as a leader tonight, leading us into the truth that we find in the world. As we spend the time to come here, that the purpose of your coming to the Bible study will be fulfilled. And the purpose for the Lord bringing you will be fulfilled as well. Pray that the entrance of the word will bring light, knowledge, enlightenment, direction, directives unto you. And crooked things will be straightened out in your life, in your pathway. As we study the word tonight.
In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name, we glorify you, we exalt and honor you because you are God. The creator of the heavens and the earth. You've created us and you've made us, you redeemed us by the blood of Jesus, your only begotten son. You brought us close to you, into the family of God. And then you've given us the revelation of your mind, your will, and your word. Lord, we pray as we come tonight, you open our eyes to see, to behold, and to learn great, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. The things we knew before we prayed that you remind us of. And the convictions we had before we pray, you confirm us in those convictions in Jesus' name. The truth we need to know, we need to learn. Lord, we pray you teach us convincingly tonight in Jesus' name. Where we're ignorant, enlighten us. Help us, Lord, to know what your word says and what your word reveals. And to stand by that word and live by that word in Jesus' name. We pray that those who are here tonight who have not known you, have not been saved, we pray that the word will come to them. The Spirit of the Lord will bring conviction upon them. And then they lift up their eyes to Calvary by faith and repent of their sins and be born again in Jesus' name. We pray that tonight you restore backsliders. And then you help us to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. That Lord will bring glory to you in everything we think and everything we do. Everything in our lives will bring glory and honor to you in Jesus' name. As we learn, may we stand and learn, sit and learn, and stay and learn as in the presence of the Almighty God. Lord, we pray that you give us the attitude of real children of God. That your word will not fall to the ground, but these words will turn our lives around. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see now. We come to our study of the Bible. And it's wonderful to see you tonight as you have come. And to all those people who are out there and you are learning with us uh, through the satellite, we're we're happy that you are here with us. And as we share the word of God together, we pray that this word will come to you and give you all the relevant spiritual knowledge that you need. And we pray this word will be of great, tremendous benefit to every one of us studying together tonight in Jesus' name. When Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to read and study tonight from Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through to 18. But I need to remind you, we'll be studying about Daniel. This is the Daniel that came from Jerusalem of Judah. And was taken in captivity along with many other people. And he came to Babylon. When he came to Babylon, as you know the story already, the king Nebuchadnezzar said he wanted children, your young people, teenagers of the royal family, that they'll be chosen and then they'll be trained for three years. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came into that company. And into that, a group of students that came to study. They studied the science of the Chaldeans and the language of the Chaldeans. And it was at that time that Daniel singled out himself a righteous young man. A convinced and convicted young man. A person that had a life that was straightforward and righteous. And he said he was going to make his stand known. Even though he was far away from home. He took his conviction from with him. And he took his conviction to stand on the word of God. He took that away from Judah. From Jerusalem of Judah. And now in Babylon the conviction was still there. That's what, what you find in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Not only Daniel will learn that his friends and companions, they joined him as well. As we look at verse 11, then Daniel said unto Melza, whom the prince of the eunuchs had made or had said over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove thy servants, servants in the plural. The four of them were taking his stand. 
And the Lord honored them in that stand. Look at verse 17. As for these four children, teenagers they were, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Why am I reading that? I'm reading that as a preparation for Daniel chapter 2. When God has an assignment for somebody, he trains you. And then he equips you. He gives you skills so that before that assignment comes, you already have what it takes to be able to fulfill the will of God, the mind of God, the calling of God, the commission. The Lord is going to give you in that future ministry. As we come to Daniel chapter 2, you will see that Daniel was well prepared for this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were well prepared for this because the Lord had given them the gift necessary to be able to solve the problem of the king we have in chapter 2. In chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1 now, chapter 2, verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. You see that? Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. And he's going to look for an interpreter. And you remember what we have read in chapter 1, verse 17. That Daniel had understanding in all wisdom and dreams. Now we're told in chapter 2, verse 1, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams where, wherewith a spirit was troubled and a sleep break from him. Before we go on, we need to understand that dreams are common experiences unto man. From the time of Genesis, the Lord had been speaking to people. And there were times he'll speak to them in dreams or night visions. And we're told that most dreams are a result of an active mind. Replaying the activities and the concerns and the thoughts and the fears and the desires and experiences of life during the day. Most of the time, what you saw in the afternoon, what you did in the afternoon, what you are involved with in the afternoon is what is replaced in the night. As we are told in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, reading from verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3 For a dream cometh through the multitude of business A dream cometh through the multitude of activities Of concerns, of thoughts, of the things that you did during the day And a fool's voice is known by the multitudes of words In verse 7 For in the multitude of dreams and many words There are also diverse vanities But fear thou God even though we have said that, there are some special times that God has given dreams unto people. And you remember in the Bible how many people had dreams. And these times when God gave them dreams, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, He was trying to convey some important messages unto men. The dreams God gave to His people did not need to be interpreted by any other person. Think about that. If you are a child of God, all those people that were children of God, God gave them dreams. And He didn't look for interpretation interpreters at all. Do you remember Jacob? God gave him a dream. He didn't look for interpreter. He knew that a child of God being spoken to by the Almighty God in the dream. You don't need an interpreter. Even Abimelech, he wasn't really a child of God, but he was a moral person. He was a person that had some kind of righteousness. And God spoke to him in a dream. He woke up in the morning not looking for interpreter. He knew the meaning of the dream. I about Joseph, that child of God that lived a righteous life, a proper life, a godly life. When God gave him a dream, he didn't need any interpreter about Solomon. Solomon was uh, had a dream and God appeared unto him in a dream by night. When he woke up in the morning, he knew the meaning of the dream. You come to the New Testament, there's another Joseph in the New Testament. That's the husband of Mary the Virgin. And God gave him a dream concerning the pregnancy that that is of the Holy Ghost. He wasn't looking for interpreter. You think about the wise men that came from the east. 
Pharisees. They came to see the baby Jesus. And then God gave them a dream. They shouldn't go back unto Herod. They need an interpreter for that. In fact, sometimes even unbelievers don't need interpreters. You remember Pilate's wife. She came to the husband Pilate and said, Have nothing to do with the blood of that innocent man. Because I suffered many things in my dream tonight concerning him. And they will find Paul the apostle. In the night, God appeared to him in a dream. In the night vision. And a man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. What are we saying? If you're a child of God, you're not looking for prophets and interpreters of dreams to interpret anything for you. In the case of Pharaoh, in the Old Testament, he needed an interpreter. The Almighty God was speaking and he didn't know the voice of God or the mind of God. He wasn't a child of God. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, he too was not a child of God. He was an idol worshiper. And God gave him a dream. He needed a child of God to come and interpret that to him. Do you remember the chief baker and the chief butler that were in the prison with Joseph? They needed interpreters because they were not children of God. It's very clear in the word of God. If you are a child of God, God gives you a dream. He'll tell you the meaning. He'll show you the way. He'll make you know the significance of the dream he has given you as well as the implication and the meaning of that dream. But if somebody is not a child of God, he'll be looking for a prophet. He'll be looking for an interpreter. He'll be looking for somebody to come and tell him the meaning of his dream. From the early history of man on earth, God had always spoken through dreams. We're told in, in Job chapter 33, you see how God has been speaking to men through dreams. So as to give them instruction, so as to give them directives, and so as to show them what they ought to know. Job chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. So very clearly there, God sometimes spoke to people in the past, and sometimes he still does that now. He speaks to people through dreams. Let's just go through a few of the dreams that we find in the Bible. Coming from God, not coming from the many activities of the day. Number one, God spoke to Abimelech through a dream to reveal a hidden truth to him and to preserve his life from death and save his household from destruction. What a great dream that was. Number two, God spoke to Jacob in a dream and then he was reassured of divine protection, preservation and the fulfillment of God's promises. Number three, God spoke to Joseph. And he had these dreams where God revealed the divine purpose for his life and to prepare him for the future. Number four, God spoke to uh, Pharaoh's servants, the butler and the baker. They had dreams and those dreams were interpreted by Joseph. An interpretation came through and uh, the one that uh, Joseph said, you're going to lose your life as the meaning of the dream. Uh, Joseph had been faithful and and it was exactly that. And the one that Joseph said, three days time, the Lord, uh, your Lord will call you back. It was exactly so. Number five, God gave dreams of national significance to Pharaoh, which preserved God's covenant people from death during famine. Number six, the Midianite had a dream given by God that revealed the victory of Gideon over the Midianites. Number seven, God met the minister to Solomon in a dream and received supernatural wisdom above all others on earth. Number eight, God spoke to Joseph the husband of Mary, and also spoke to the wise men from the east through dreams and the life of Jesus when he was in infancy was preserved. The question then is, can God speak to people today through dreams? Oh yes, he still does. Uh, sometimes uh, we're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts 
chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. It says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall do what? Dream dreams. And it says it's the last days when God pours out his Holy Spirit that he still gives the dreams to people when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. But we need to say this, that any dream you have, you need to compare it with the Word of God. Don't just run away with dreams. I had a dream, I had a dream. The dream might be from God, might not be from God. If it contradicts the Word of God, it's not of God. But if it's in line with the word of God, then it may be coming from God. In Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 25. I have heard what the prophet said, that, dream, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. The people that major in dreams, they only talk about dreams. They do not read the word of God, the scriptures given by inspiration that is good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, in righteousness. They do not read the word of God that is infallible, that has no mistakes. All they go about is dream, dream, dream. God says, I'm against that. The people that say I've dreamed, I've dreamed. In verse 26, how long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the, of the deceit of their own heart, which seem to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams. There are people that will cause other people to forget. Forget the doctrine. Forget the teaching. Forget the revelation of the truth of the word of God, of the scriptures, by their dreaming. And God says, I'm against that. Never exalt any dream above the revealed word of God, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Verse 28, the prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. He that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is charged to the wheat, says the Lord. The Lord is saying that the word of God is like wheat, and the dreams are like chaff. That means that, you know, if you look at the dreams that people have, and they run about and go about, I have a dream, I have a dream, it's all child, non-essentials. But the word of God is the wheat that feeds us and that blesses our souls. It says what is child to the wheat is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets. Says the Lord, that steal my words, everyone, from his neighbor. Behold, I'm against the prophet, says the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith, Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, says the Lord. And do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies, by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. But thank God for the dream we're looking at today. This one is coming from God. And it's revealing some great, great things coming from the very mind of God. We're back to Daniel chapter 2 now. Tonight we're looking at the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And this dream of Nebuchadnezzar was given by God. It troubled his heart. Let me go back to chapter 2 verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, where with his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. As you see on your outline, we're talking about divine revelation that troubles the heart. Divine revelation that troubles the heart. We're dividing the study today to three parts. Number one, the painful impact 
of the king's forgotten dream. He forgot the dream. It became very painful to him. His heart was troubled. The painful impact of the king's forgotten dream. Number two, the perplexing impossibility of the king's frightening demand. He demanded that his wise men, the Chaldeans, the astrologers should come and recall the dream for him. He had forgotten. If they could recall it and they tell it, then he will remember. And then if they were able to do that, he'll be sure that they'll be able to give him the interpretation. But that demand was perplexing. It was confusing. Nobody had ever asked anything like that. It was like an impossibility. You dreamt and you forgot. How can I come and remind you of what you have forgotten? Then number three, the potential implication of the king's faulty decree. He made a decree in his fury, in his anger, in his frustration, in his confusion. He had to make a decree that if they could not do what he wanted them to do, which was an impossible case, this is what he was going to do to them. We'll come back to number one, the painful impact of the king's forgotten dream. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2 now. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. He demanded that they will come, and of course they are to come. They were serving him. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then speak the Chaldeans to the king in Syria, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be caught in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunk hill. That's the introduction to the whole scenario we have in this chapter 2. You'll find that he dreamed a dream. And because he dreamt the dream, it was frightening. And because it made him afraid, he wanted to know what's the meaning of this? What's the implication of this? What's the almighty creator God in heaven trying to show me? And yet I've forgotten. The same frightened him so much, even though he had forgotten. And then eventually, oh, what's this? Oh, what's actually happening here? Look at verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Nebuchadnezzar knew it was something concerning the future. He knew that it was something the almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, was trying to reveal. He knew that the one that knows the end from the beginning, that knows the future from the present, he knew that it is that God of the past, of the present, of the future, that is trying to reveal something to him. This must be very important, but he had forgotten all about it. And he wanted some people that claimed to have some supernatural powers to come and reveal that unto him. And then as you look at verse 29, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth a secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Before he slept, he had been thinking of what will come in the future. And then God revealed that to him. That revelation actually made him afraid. Uh, that's what you find in the word of God. That sometimes God reveals his mind. And the people who do not know the Lord, they do not understand that revelation. Because of that lack of understanding, they become afraid. Genesis chapter 41. In Genesis chapter 41, we see the, a similar scene that God revealed his mind, revealed what was coming in the future. He revealed that to Pharaoh. We're told in chapter 41, reading from verse 25, Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. 
It's not happened yet. It's still in the future. And Joseph said, God is about to do this. And this is going to have, it's an event of national impact. It's an event of international impact. It's going to impact and influence and affect other nations too. And God is trying to show this unto you. Verse 28. This is a scene which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, this he shows unto Pharaoh in Isaiah. I'm reading from chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, reading from verse 19. The, the dream that God gave this man, Nebuchadnezzar, had a future fulfillment was still to come in the future. Yes, he had forgotten that frightened him, that made him afraid. And uh, because he was afraid, that's why he wanted uh, those people to come and give him a quick interpretation, a quick revelation of what God had in mind. And when they could not do it, that deepened his fear, that heightened his confusion. And that actually made him so frustrated and furious, he thought he must do something drastic to these people that claim to know how to interpret dreams and now they failed him at the greatest point of need. Isaiah chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 19. When they shall say unto you, seek unto them that are familiar spirits unto, and unto wizards that peep and that mortar should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead. Isaiah is saying, it's almost saying if, if you, if he had been there, when, when Nebuchadnezzar was sending for those Chaldeans would have been saying, what are you doing? God is revealing something to you. And then you are calling the servants of Satan to come and tell you the might of the Almighty God. It never works that way. God is light. And then you are calling the people that have powers of darkness to come and interpret to you the revelation of the God who is light. In verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Lord is telling us that when he reveals his mind to us, either in the Bible or he reveals himself to us in vision and dream, we should not go to messengers of Satan to the witches and to the wizards and to the people that peep and to the occultic people telling them, asking them to reveal the mind of the almighty God unto us. In fact, we are warned very seriously in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. Now in this nation in which we live, in the nation where you are living, you know what people do when they have problems like this. Something happens in the night. Something they don't understand. Something they feel that medical science cannot solve what do they do they go to the witches and the wizards and the lord is saying that is the practice of the pagans that's the practice of the gentiles the practice of the heathens and he's saying we must never do anything like that as children of god that's why it says when thou art come into the land which the lord thy god giveth thee thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations of those nations they are shall not be found among you any anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that you said divination or an observer of times an observer of times what does that mean does he look at the horoscope you know, sometimes in some of in some magazines and papers, they'll be writing, if you are born in January, you look at this, or February, you look at that. That's horoscope. And it is not for the children of God. It is occultism. And you cannot be telling or looking for your future and for the plan of God for you in the future. Through that, it's like what I've told you now. God, you want to know the mind of God. And then you are going to Satan. Satan, can you tell me the mind of God? No, he cannot. Demons, can you tell us the mind of God? No, they cannot. Evil spirits, can you tell us the mind of God? No, they cannot. They are not in God's counsel. 
because they are of darkness and God is of light, it is wrong for anyone to be seeking to know the mind of God through all these in verse 11, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirit, or a wizard, or a necromancer, just to consult the spirit of the dead. And they say they're looking for the future. They want to know the meaning of why there's confusion in their lives, why there's yoke in their lives, why there's problem in their lives, and why do they have so many questions and so many things that are unraveled in their lives. And they want to be able to see the implication or the meaning, the interpretation of those things. You cannot do that because you will not get the truth from Satan. He is a liar. And then you bring yourself under a yoke, under a curse, because you go to Satan and to look for solution to any problem. In verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. You know the implication of that, the meaning of that, is that even the unbelievers that do that, God judges them. Because of these abominations that the heathens have done, God it is say, well, they are unbelievers, they are sinners, they are pagans, they are heathens, and what else can they do? I will overlook it. No, God doesn't overlook it. Just like if a sinner steals, God doesn't overlook it. If a sinner commits adultery, God doesn't overlook it. God doesn't say, what can he do? He's a sinner, he will sin. He's a sinner, he will steal. He's a sinner, he will, he will kill. He will still punish him. The same thing when those sinners go to the necromancers, to the witches, to the wizards, and they go to the spirit of the dead and get involved in occultism, God still punishes them. That's what he's saying in verse 12. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. In verse 13, for thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken to the observer of times and unto diviners but as for thee, the Lord thy God has not permitted, allowed, suffered thee so to do. And so then the Lord doesn't want us to get involved with any of these things that the unbelievers, they have, they have done. This revelation from God to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream. When he woke up, he had forgotten the details of the dream. Yet his spirit was troubled. The dream had made a deep, solemn impression upon his mind. His mind was greatly distressed. He awoke from his sleep in great alarm. He was the greatest and the most powerful man on earth. Surrounded by the greatest security wealth and might could provide. Yet the Lord had ways and means to frighten such men and throw them into great perplexity and anxiety. Think about that. That Nebuchadnezzar was a great man, a great emperor of a great empire. He had riches, he had wealth, he had servants, he had a great cabinet. All the same, the Lord was able to frighten him with just a dream. If on earth God could frighten such great men, mighty men, powerful men, rich men, wealthy men like that on earth, how much more when he eventually gets to the great beyond? When he face, when he gets face to face with God, not just a dream, but now a reality. Look at what's going to happen at that time. Sinners will tremble in the presence of the Lord. If they could tremble here just by a dream, how much more when they come face to face with the Almighty God uh, on the judgment throne. In Revelation chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 6, we're reading from verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the, of, of the mountains, and said to the mountains, and to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Think about that. If God could frighten them, make them afraid, 
afraid here on earth by just a dream. How much more when he comes face to face with the Almighty God for the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Malachi chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 2. Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. When a day of wrath comes, those great men that seem not to care today, that don't know there's something beyond the grave, they'll be terribly afraid. They will quake and they will tremble. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. But who who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soul. If you're going to be afraid of God, let that fear drive you to repentance today rather than waiting too late. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, we're coming back to what we have read now in Daniel. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, he was desperate to recall the dream and to have a proper interpretation of that dream. He therefore called all the people, he called the wise men, the philosophers, the stargazers in Babylon. They had professed much wisdom through natural skills and occultic means, but their deception was exposed. Consulting occultic, the occultic when in trouble opens people to deception. Not only that, to satanic attack. Not only that, to God's wrath. Have you ever consulted those uh, people when you were young, necromancers? And uh, people that had familiar spirits and witches and wizards. Have you gotten involved with any occultic thing? You ought to repent. Because if you don't repent, you multiply your problem. You multiply uh, the evil things upon your life. And the problem you are trying to solve will not be solved. And you get into more problems even because of that. Consulting herbalists. Consulting magicians, consulting occultic people, consulting the people that have dark powers or powers of darkness gets you more into trouble than the one you are trying to run away from. In Second Kings chapter 1, Second Kings chapter 1, we're looking at verse 2. Second Kings chapter 1, verse 2. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice. In his, uh, in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, that was an accident. He fell down unexpectedly. And when he fell down, he became sick. He was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. When people are sick, it is what happens to them. And when they are sick like that, you sleep in the night and some kind of funny dreams will be coming. Because your thoughts are disturbed, your mind is disturbed, your brain is still replaying what you've been thinking about during the day. Am I going to live? Am I going to die? Are the enemies going to conquer me? Am I going to lose my land? Am I going to lose my family? Is life coming to an end? Because of all those things you are thinking about. Because you are not going back to the word of God, because you are not going back to the promises of God, and because you are not meditating upon this book of the Lord, we shall not depart out of your mouth. A lot of confusing thoughts will come, and then you have some nightmares and some bad dreams, and you wake up in the morning. What do you do? You go back to God. You say, God, I don't understand this, but the dream will not define my life. The dream will not uh, uh, give me anything. Your word is still going to be the overall sin in my life. If you do that, then the Lord will give you a solution. If you are sick, He will heal you in Jesus' name. But you see, the people that are not having their minds on God, they go to the God of the Ekrans. They go to all the sheds around where they burn candle and they, and they, and they burn incense. And what they call the name of angels or the name of demons or the names of this and that. And where they have some secret powers. And then you compound your problem. You multiply your problem in verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, now therefore? The word therefore means because of that step you have taken. 
because of sending messengers to those people that are parts of darkness therefore thou says the lord thou shalt not come down from the bed from that bed on which thou art gone up but shall surely die he died in that situation under the wrath of God. There's another king that happened to him. First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. He was, uh, you know, going to face a battle. And instead of just staying with God, a king in Israel, the first king in Israel, instead of staying with God, he went to call on this uh, one, the witch of Endon. And if you have been serving the Lord, and then a problem occurs, a problem happens, something arises. If you go back to the path of darkness, and if you go back to the village, if you go back to all those uh, habits uh, sitting on the ground, and doing this and that, you compound your problem, and you make yourself a servant of Satan and again, if you die in that harbourless shed, then you go to hell because you die under the anger of God. I pray that will not happen to you. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter ten. I'm reading from verse thirteen. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the watch of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel. That's why he died. Also for asking counsel. For asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. He inquired not of the Lord therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse. And so you'll find that in the case of uh, in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, he called for those magicians and those Chaldeans and those wise men of Babylon. Were they able to solve his problem? Were they able to solve his problem? No, they are never able to solve the problem. Only God can solve our problems. He's ready and he says, come unto me. He will reveal his mind to us in Jesus' name. We come now to point number two, the perplexing impossibility of the king's frightening demand. The king's frightening demand. He demanded something from them. I'm reading from verse 5. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 5, the king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, The sin is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be caught in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dung hill. But if ye show, if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. The king was desperate. He felt that there's nothing else I'm interested in. That dream must, must be recalled. And the interpretation of the dream must be made known to me. I'm not interested in any other scene. And all the discussion, they were trying to buy time. And they were trying to question the king. Just tell us and then we're going to give you the interpretation. He said, hey, I'm telling you something. Tell me now, now. I'm desperate about this. And eventually he had to threaten them and make a decree because they will not, they will not reveal to him what was asking them. I'm reading now from verse 7, and they answered and said again, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation uh, of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that he would gain the time. What did he mean by that? He said, now I'm troubled. And as time passes, it may mean, it may be that my mind will rest. And I say, okay, I don't worry anymore. It doesn't make me afraid anymore. Because when the time passes, sometimes what made you afraid two years ago may not be making you afraid today. What made you afraid even last week may not have that impact upon you this week. Is that you are trying to buy time. Because you see that the thing is going away from me. And I know the kind of game you are playing, and the game will not work on this side because you see the sin is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream in verse 9, there is but one decree for you. 
For ye, we ye are prepared lying and corrupt ones to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream and I shall know that ye shall show me the interpretation thereof. In verse 10 the Chaldean and said and, and before the king and said there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. There is not a man upon the earth. You know what they were saying? Because they couldn't do it, they said nobody else can do it. Because they couldn't recall the dream, they said there's nobody on what we cannot do, nobody on earth can do it. Do you know some people like that? The people of the world, whatever we cannot do, nobody else can do it. And Daniel was nearby. Shedak, Meshach, and Abednego were nearby. Because they are the spirit of God. And they are the gifts of recalling those dreams and interpreting those dreams. They are the gifts of the spirit in their lives. But these people did not reckon with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They just said point blank unto the king. There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that has such things as any magician, or astrologer, or Chaldean. It it is a rare thing that the king requires. They said, Nebuchadnezzar the king, we respect you and love you and honor you, but you know, this time now what you're asking us to do is rare. Nobody ever asked magicians or occultic people anything like this. There is none other that can show each before the king except the gods, except the gods. And those gods are not here in Babylon. They don't live here with people whose dwelling is not with flesh. That's what they said, and, and that made the Nebuchadnezzar more frustrated about it. But were they not telling the truth? In a way, they were telling the truth. They were saying, what you want us to do? No man of natural understanding, natural skill, natural learning can do this and reveal this unto you. Unaided men, natural men, they will find this impossible. What they didn't understand is what is impossible with man is possible with God. Is that right? Even though they couldn't understand, even though they couldn't, they couldn't show the interpretation of the meaning, yet there's a God in heaven, and that God in heaven, there's a Daniel, a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that knew that God, and they knew the power of that God. They had good relationship with that God, and eventually you'll see as the story unfolds that they were able to come and show the king what he was looking for. In Isaiah chapter 41, verses 28 and 20, Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 28 and verse 29. In verse 28, for I beheld there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. That's the situation in which Nebuchadnezzar found himself. Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. It's very good that a situation like this came because otherwise if a situation like this did not come, the Chaldeans will say they can do anything and they can reveal anything. They can interpret any dream. But now this situation came and showed us and showed them and showed the whole of the people in Babylon that they were all vanity and liars and they were nothing in the sight of the Almighty God. When the real test actually came, they failed. And you'll see that all these people that are saying they can do this and that, when the real test comes, they always fail. But the people of God will know the truth in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you enter into the boss and you know, somebody is making a noise and he's saying, he has this medicine, he has this and has that. This one will kill this and kill this and kill that. That's talk of mouth. When the real test really comes, they always fail. But thank God, we have a God in heaven. And that God will never fail. And we are people of God that have the spirit of God. And by the grace of God, we, in connection, in relationship with the Lord, like Daniel did not fail, we will not fail in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 44, I'm reading from verse 24. Isaiah 44, verse 24. It just says, The Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formeth thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. And 
that spreadest abroad, the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars. Frustrated the tokens of the liars. And it's the Lord that frustrated all these people and make it diviners mad, that turneth the wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. He makes their knowledge foolish. All the things they were, pr- they were proud of, the Lord just said, everything is nothing. The people of the world, they'll find when the real trial comes and the real test comes, they'll find themselves to be nothing but the name of Jesus will be all in all. Jeremiah chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the words which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. You see how the heathen solve their problems? You see how the people of the world, like Nebuchadnezzar, how they try to solve their problems? They call magicians. And the Lord is saying, don't you do that. Learn not the way of the heathen. They will call the astrologers and the occultic people. They will go in the secret in the night. They are looking for somebody that will be able to read the unwriting on the wall. And the Lord is saying, don't you do that. Depend upon the Lord. Walk in the light. Because Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If you're a child of God, you'll not have anything to do with these walks of darkness. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. In verse 3, for the customs of the people are vain. Their practices their idolatry is vain. Maybe when somebody has died, they want to find out what killed that person. When somebody has died, they want to do some rituals. When somebody has died, they want to do some sacrifices so that the lives of the other people that are still alive will be preserved. That's the custom of the heathen. And the Lord is saying, don't you ever get involved in anything like that. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The walk of the hand of the workman with the axe. They deck each with silver and with gold. They fasten each with nails and, and with hammers. And uh, that it move, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, be carried, because they cannot go, they cannot move, they cannot, they cannot walk. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and, th- and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee does it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. Our God is a great God. Our God is a mighty God. There is none like him of all those people in the world. Did this say magicians, they confess. They said, this is perplexing. This is confusing. This is a rare thing you're asking. Many who judge Nebuchadnezzar for a question, for requiring a rare thing, also are guilty today of thinking that science and might and occultic power can solve all their problems. Have you, have you noticed uh, how some people, how some people live their lives? It's like, you know, science will solve all problems. Money will solve all problems. Knowledge will solve all problems. They say, well, what do they need to do with God? Wait until problems come. There are many problems in this world that the Chaldeans will not be able to solve. The Babylon, with all their, with all their progress in science, all their progress in learning, that Babylon will not be able to solve. And that's why it is very good to depend upon God. Because when we depend upon God, with God, all things are possible. And whatever problem, whatever challenge we have in our lives, we take to God, the Lord will be able to solve it in Jesus' name. Now because Nebuchadnezzar could not solve the problem, he became frustrated, he became unhappy. 
he became actually angry. And because of that frustration, confusion, and anger, here is what he decided he was going to do. Point number three, the potential implication of the king's faulty decree. The, pot the potential implication of the king's faulty decree. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 12, Daniel chapter 2, verse 12. For this cause the king was angry and very furious. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. We need to think through on what we're reading. It's not good to just read the Bible and put yourself in the place of Nebuchadnezzar. Why do you get angry whenever you get angry? The, the solution is here. Why did Nebuchadnezzar get angry? He had a desire and that desire was not fulfilled. He had a demand and that demand was not met. He had an expectation and that expectation was not met. Why do people get angry? They have a desire. They have, they have something. This should happen. And when the thing does not happen, they get angry. And they feel that here is what I wish, here is what I demand, here is what I desire. And if the thing that ought to happen to please them, if those things do not happen, that's how they get angry. If you are an angry man, angry woman, analyze your anger. Why do you get angry? Because you are looking for something. And what you are looking for did not come true. And because nothing did not come true, then you became angry. But is the anger justified? That's the question. Is the anger reasonable? Let's analyze it, Nebuchadnezzar. Do you have the right to be angry at this time? Didn't you examine all those people that went through the learning? You also have some knowledge yourself. And you are not an ignorant person. You are not an illiterate. You have some knowledge of science, of all this astrology and everything. If you were all that you know, he knew enough to be able to test all those young people. And he found Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ten times higher than all the rest of them. If you knew all that and yet you forgot your own dream, who is more guilty? You are the dream and you forgot. These people never had a dream. Analyze. You see, when you analyze situations in your life, your anger will deflate. It will be like a balloon. And then just put some pin there and all the air is gone. And you say, I don't have any right to be angry. Now, he got angry. And now we have seen he didn't have a right to be angry. Now, the decision he was going to take, what decision was that? Was going to kill all the wise men. Let, let's think about this now, Nebuchadnezzar, before you go ahead. What are you trying to do? I'm going to kill all these wise men. Why? I'm angry because they're not able to solve my problem. You know what? If you kill them, those are your security men. Those are your wise men. That's the cabinet that surrounded him. If you destroy the cabinet that surrounded you because of this single problem they're not able to solve, another problem will come tomorrow, and now you're going to start all over again to train people all over because all the wise men have been destroyed and killed. When people get angry, they walk against themselves. They decide against themselves. They act against themselves. And they do things that will hurt them. It's like you're angry with a pilot uh, that is flying the airplane. And then you go to the place, the cockpit, and say, what are you doing there? Then you throw him out. You destroy yourself. It's like you're angry with the, with the driver that is driving the bus and is, you know, it's on the top speed. And then you go in there, you say, I'm angry with you and I'm going to deal with you. You deal with him and then you kill yourself and kill everybody there. This man did not understand. Anger closes your eye and you're not able to think. You're not able to think through. He now said, now, because of this, he was angry, very furious, and he commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Wait a minute. You're also going to destroy Daniel with them. Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. What will you do? You're not going to see the miracle in chapter 3. If you kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're not going to see the interpretation of the dream in chapter 4. If you kill Daniel. And when the writing on the wall comes for Belshazzar. You're not going to find Daniel to read. 
and interpret for you because you have killed him. And then when you come to chapter 7 to chapter 12, all those revelations are going to be forgotten. They will not exist because you killed Daniel. Because you get angry, you kill that person today who should bring the revelation tomorrow. Anytime you get angry, think about it. Have you, have you thought about a husband that is angry against the wife? The wife has done something. Maybe she is cooking food and, you know, the food is burnt. And the wife is pregnant. And because of that burnt yam or burnt potato, the man gets angry. And whatever he has in hand, he wants to deal with the woman. And while struggling and fighting with the woman, she loses the pregnancy. Who knows what that child would have become? A professor, a lawyer, or a governor, or even a president of a country. But the child now is aborted. The child is dead because the man got angry over the over burnt food. How many times somebody, a student, might get angry at a teacher and then he begins to throw whatever it is and then he dismisses that child and because of that temporary anger, he loses the future, the future thing that he should have had. And this is what was happening to this man at Nebuchadnezzar. He got angry. Do you ever get angry in your life? Sit back and relax and think through on that anger and see the consequence not on the people you are angry at, the consequence upon yourself. That's what we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Looking at verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Be not hasty. That is, don't be thoughtless. Think through. Analyze it. Sit down. Look at the situation. Ask yourself questions. As this situation has happened, and then anger is trying to raise up its ugly head in your heart, sit down. Look at it very well. Who is guilty? Who is at fault? Even if the other man is at fault, the action I'm going to take, is this the best action? Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of, of who? Of fools. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear, and slow to speak. And slaughter off. Why? Because when you hear, think of what you have heard. Think of what you have heard. Nebuchadnezzar, did you think of what these uh, magicians said? Did you think of what uh, these Chaldeans said? They said, there is no king, there is no lord that has never demanded anything like this of any man before. Think through and think on that. You know, if you think through on what you hear, you think through on what you see, uh, your anger will go away. Then it says, for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Now, this is church. You are a child of God. What are you committed to? You are committed to walking out the righteousness of God. And that is what you prayed for. That is your commitment. That's your consecration. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm committed to seeing your righteousness that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Well, if that is your commitment, the wrath of man will never walk the righteousness of God. If your commitment is just to glorify God, the wrath of man will never glorify God. If your commitment is to exalt and honor God, the wrath of man will never, never walk the glory and the honor of God. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 8. Colossians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 8. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Feel the communication out of your mouth. Put off all these. It's talking about, you know, you are wearing something, you are wearing a dress. It says, put it off. 
how what, what does that mean it's like you know if you're going for an occasion outside let's say uh, you're going for a church service let's say you're going for an interview let's say you're going to visit your in-laws let's say you want to get married and you want to visit the people that he is the father and the mother going to give you that lady and then you wear a particular dress and say hey this dress does not fit, fit where i'm going it is where you are going that determines what you wear it is the place you are going that should determine what you put on and if you see that that thing does not match the place you are going then you put it up now where are you going you're going to glory land and you want the glory of god and you want god to be glorified and honored and exalted in your life anger if you put on anger that does not befit where you're going you want to honor the lord you want to exalt the lord and you want the lord to be glorified in your life that's your goal. That's where you are going. If you put on anger like clothing, that kind of clothing does not befit where you are going. Therefore, put it off. Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and fill the communication out of your mouth. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It says because of where you are going and what you are putting on. If you are putting on anger, you are putting on wrath and bitterness. That doesn't match the place you are going. Put it off and be kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And that's what the Lord is telling us. As we come back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 12. Daniel chapter 2, reading again from verse 12. Here it says in verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men, no exception, every one of them, all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. That was the decree that he made. By the way, when he made that decree, he was hurting himself. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. Woe unto them that make or decree unrighteous decrees. Brothers and sisters, will you look up for a moment? Let's apply this to Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to think about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a king. And he had, and you know, kings and you know, presidents of uh, any country, they have ministers, they have the cabinet, and they have advisors, advisors in education, advisors in industry, advisors in politics, advisors in religion. And all these advisors actually are called the wise men. They are the people, they have acquired a lot of wisdom on earth, in school, in experience. That's why they surround the president. That's why they surround the king. And they are to advise him on what to do in relating with the public, in keeping the public calm and society controllable and governable. These are the people. Now, he makes an unrighteous decree. And he says, all the members of the cabinet, no, not just one, not just two, all of them, every one of them killed. There will be insecurity in that nation. Once you destroy the whole of the cabinet, and you destroy the whole of all the advisors, all the ministers, all the people surrounded themselves with, himself with, that's what anger does closes your eyes. You walk against yourself. If you're a woman, when nothing comes upon you, the decision you take against your husband. If you're a husband, the decision you take against your wife. If you're a child, the decision you take against your parents. You forget school fees, you still come from them. You forget they are the people to give you accommodation. You forget they are people to protect you for your security. You forget everything when you get angry. If you are an employee working somewhere and then you are angry against the employer, you forget that it's difficult to get a job outside. You just, you know, just get angry and do whatever you want to do. But you work against yourself. That's why it says war unto them that decree 
unrighteous decrees that write grievousness which they have prescribed. And that was the case of this man here because the anger just blindfolded him and he could not see. I pray that God will help us. But now we come, there's somebody here, there's Daniel, and then there is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See the decree that has come out. Will they just kill these people like that? God has prepared Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has a ministry for him. Will this man just die like this because Nebuchadnezzar is angry? No, God will protect his own. And God will protect you. In Genesis chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 23. Genesis chapter 18. We're looking at verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Well, thou also destroy the righteous of the wicked. O Lord, you know everything that happens on earth. Daniel is there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are there. Here the decree has come out now. Will you allow Daniel and, your, and his companions, his friends, to die just like that? In verse 25, verse 25, that, that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous of the wicked. Wicked, and that the righteous should be should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right god will protect you like he protected daniel shadam bishak and abednego he'll protect you in jesus name in psalm 125 verses 3 and 4 psalm 125 verses 3 and 4 for the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous the lot of the wicked shall not rest upon me. I said, the lot of the wicked shall not rest upon me. I but upon you will not rest upon you. Let the less the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that be upright in their hearts. The Lord delivered Daniel. How did the Lord deliver Daniel? Let's come back now to Daniel chapter 2. What did the Lord use to deliver Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We're looking at verse 14. Number one, Daniel's wisdom. Number one, Daniel's wisdom. And God will give you wisdom. And then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch. The captain of the king's guard, which was gone for to slay the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel, I think about this Daniel. You think, Daniel, he was a righteous man? Yes, more than that. The righteous is as bold as a lion. See this man, Daniel, he was just sitting in his house. And then this man came with a sword in the hand. And he didn't tremble, he didn't shake because he knew that his life, his time was in the hands of God, not in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And so he said, what have you come to do? You've never come like this with a sword to my house. What's happening today? And then we're told and he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? And Arioch made the thing known unto Daniel. He answered with wisdom. Everywhere you go, tell the Lord to give you wisdom. And the Lord will give you wisdom. Because it is that wisdom that helps us to be able to befriend even our enemies. That the people that wanted to hurt us, they'll say, no, I don't want to really hurt you. This is what I demand and this is what I want. If you will do this, then I'm all right. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, for the grace of his lips... Even it says in that verse 11, the king shall be his friend. For the grace of his leaves, the king shall be his friend. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 2. And let's look at verse 16. Daniel chapter 2 verse 16. Then Daniel went to his, uh, sorry, verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time. He went into the king and he demanded to give him time. Think about that. What was the one thing Nebuchadnezzar was saying to those wise men? He said, I know what you are doing. You want the time to change. And you want the time to be prolonged so that I will forget. The thing he didn't want to give to those wise men of Babylon, Daniel went in and he said, uh, 
king, give me time. He wouldn't give the time to some countrymen, to the Chaldeans. And when Daniel went in for the grace of his leaves, even the king shall be his friend. If you know how to communicate, if you know how to talk. The people that were angry before, and this were so angry, as almost as if they were having mental problems, that they said, kill all the wise men. When you're going with the wisdom of God, with the love of God, with the grace of God, God in your leaves. The king will be your friend. And it says over there, hey, give me time and he will sh- and, and that he will show to the king the interpretation. And the king just said, that's alright. That's Daniel. Ask him. If Daniel asks me for that, I'm going to give him that. Can you do that? What is a problem in your company? What is a, com- a problem in your corporation? What is a problem in your local church? What is a problem in your family? And for you to have the wisdom to communicate cage that even though the head or the manager, the director, the president, the king or the governor is very angry and he has taken a decision already and that decision is negative on any on everybody. How do you do, do you have the wisdom like Daniel to be able to go to that director, to that governor, to that president, to that leader, to, to whosoever and then with wisdom and with gentleness, with love and then you can change the situation. That's what I'm praying for you that will be a change agent for better in your community in Jesus name. Number one is the, number one is the wisdom. Number two now is the faith. Let's look at that verse 16 again. It says Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. He had not even prayed. He had not even asked God. But he had confidence in God. He had trust in God. How do you know that God is going to reveal it unto you? By faith, by faith. I believe God. I'm going to ask God because I want to have that revelation. I want to have that interpretation to be able to save the lives of all the wise men. Because of that confidence in God. That's how God showed him. And the Lord is telling us have faith in God. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 13. Speaking by faith. Speaking in wisdom and carrying the love of God with you everywhere you go. In Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13, we have in the same spirit of faith. According as, it's written, as it is written, I believe, therefore, have I spoken. Give me time, I will show you the interpretation. How do you know that? I believe, therefore, have I spoken. And it says, therefore, have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. The Lord is saying, have faith in God. If we have faith in God, all problems will be solved in Jesus' name. Number three now is companions and his friends. His companions and his friends. Daniel had companions. Daniel had uh, friends. He had fellows. And let's look at verse 13. The decree, uh, that, that's uh, Daniel chapter 2 verse 13. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain and they sought for Daniel and his fellows. Daniel and his fellows. His friends, his companions, his partners. We're looking at verse 17. In verse 17, Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. His companions. I'm asking you, who are your companions? Are your companions able to pray when troubles arise? Or the only gossip? The only exchange anger for anger? Fury for fury. The only exchange argument for argument. Who are your companions? Who are your friends? In the case of Daniel, he had companions that could pray. He had companions that could have faith in God. That's why it says in that verse 17 that he went to his house and he made the thing known to his companions. In verse 18, that, that they would deserve mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows... Daniel and his fellows should not perish. As we look at the companions of Daniel, we learn quite a lot. Number one, they were companions in purity. Companions in purity. These were the people that made up their minds. We will not defile ourselves with the portion of the king's meat. Who are your friends? 
Who are the fellows that walk around you? Who are the fellows that, you know, write to you, phone you, discuss with you, interact with you? Are they companions in purity? Number two, companions in persecution. Companions in persecution. You see these uh, people, they were looking for Daniel and his companions to slay them. Companions in persecution. They were not suffering for sin, they were suffering for righteousness. And then companions in perseverance. Have you seen Daniel? See, continue to pray. That's in chapter 6. When they said they made a decree. Anybody that will talk to God about anything, all this time, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. That man persevered, continued to pray. And then, if you don't fall down to worship this idol, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? He said, no big deal. Even if we're thrown into that furnace of fire, we're going to persevere. These were companions in perseverance. Number four is companions in prayer. They could pray. Daniel was a prayerful man. And then these companions too were prayerful men. He went in unto Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions, his fellows, so that they will demand of the Lord, so that they will not die with the people. And then companions in preaching. Companions in preaching. Your companions, I did the people that just, you know, they just gossip, they just talk, they don't understand, and they cannot share the mind of God with other people. Uh, you want to think about it from now, the companions you have, the fellows you have, the friends you have. Number one, let them be companions of impurity. Number two, let them be companions in persecution. Number three, let them be companions in perseverance, companions in prayer. Number five, companions in preaching. I'm looking at some 119, some one. 119. In Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 63. I am a companion of all them that fear thee. That means I look at all the people I have on my list as friends, as companions, as fellows. I do not have anybody that, you know, blasphemes God, dishonors God, disrespects God. That disregards God. You don't have anybody on your phone, on the list, that doesn't respect God, doesn't love God, that says, God, what are you doing? I, I don't know about you. I'm a companion of all them that fear thee. And then it says, of them that keep thy precepts. Those are the kinds of companions you ought to have. We're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. We're looking at verse 17. Proverbs 27. Reading from verse 17. Iron sharpness, iron. Iron sharpness, iron. What does that mean? Well, you understand when the iron is blunt, when your cutlass or your knife is blunt, and you want to sharpen it, it's iron that will sharpen iron. Iron will not sharpen wood. Wood will not sharpen iron. If you're going to have friends, then they should be of the people that have the same conviction, the same lifestyle, and the same purity. And the same holiness and the same doctrine that the people you have as companions, not the people that are down and then you are up. Anytime you are trying to pray, anytime you are trying to be holy, anytime you are trying to obey God, anytime you are trying to take a decision for the Lord and you are committing yourself to the Lord, the fellow is just pulling you down, pulling you down. That's not a good companion. Iron sharpness, iron. So a man sharpness the countenance of his friend. A man sharpness the countenance of his friend. That he is a man will make his friend more courageous, more bold, more decisive, and more excited in the things of the Lord. Will make him, you know, that's a friend, that's a friend, that's a good companion. You want to do something good, and that friend is cheering you up, is encouraging you. Iron sharpening iron. That's the kind of companion that Daniel had. I'm asking you, who is your partner? Who is your companion? Who is your fellow? Who is your friend? Are they the people that are pulling you back and pulling you down? They are not companions in purity. They are not companions in perseverance. They are not companions in persecution. They are not companions in prayer. They are not companions in preaching. You stand up in the bus. You stand up in the open. You want to preach. And this fellow you call your friend, call you later and said, you make me feel ashamed. What a terrible reproach. You stood up in the public and then you are opening the Bible. And, you know, if you continue like that, I'm ashamed of you. you. Did something like that. That's not a good friend. Drop him. 
drop in. I don't have intimacy with some, such a person who cannot be a companion in prayer, a companion in preaching. You know, sometimes when you have a problem, you have a burden, and you have something weighing you down. Uh, your life is at stake. And then you know that now your life is about to go. Are your friends people that can pray with you? In the case of Daniel, he had companions in prayer. Companions in prayer. He said, we have a challenge here. We have some, there's a decree here. We're going to die. And then he took that thing to the Lord in prayer. That's the kind of friend you ought to have. Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. Malachi chapter 3 verse 16. Then they that fear the Lord speak often one to another. Preaching one to another to encourage one another. To lift up one another. And to, uh, to embolden and enable one another. Equip one another. They that fear the Lord speak often one to another. And the Lord heard and, and heard it. Hacking and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. The Lord will hear your prayer. And the Lord, you know, the, the Lord will get you through all the difficulties and challenges you may face in your life in Jesus' name. Now, what happened when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they went to pray, what happened? The, the secret was the secret revealed to them. And how did they make it known to the king? How did they change the whole history of the whole nation? Come back next week and that's what I'm going to look at. That is it, very interesting. How they just went to God and everything that God Nebuchadnezzar forgot him from A to Z. God revealed everything just in one night. There was no delay at all. And then they came to the king and then Daniel said, take me to the king. Are you able to reveal what I forgot? He said, there's a God in heaven. Next week, there's a God in heaven. I said, there's a God in heaven. And see the drama. Everything totally changing. And your life will change. And your family will change. By the way, how do we get all these kind of secrets from God? How The things that the magicians don't know. The things that all the Chaldeans don't know. How do we just go into the Lord? And then point by point and detail after detail. Everything is revealed unto us. And I cannot. It looks like I cannot wait until next week. Something is going to happen. And God will open your eyes. Everything that I may dark unto you, everything will become very, very clear. There will be no impossibility in your life anymore. All those forgotten things, next week the Lord is going to recall everything. And then you'll say, Lord, I thank you for this Bible study. You'll never be the same again. We've learned something today we need to take to the Lord in prayer. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I am here today. And what I've learned today, Lord, I want this to reach my life. I don't ever want to forget this. I don't want ever, ever want to forget this. And see what the Lord has taught you today. Why don't you just say, Lord, here am I. Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. I want you to do something in my life. Something in my life through this study so that Lord, I will never, never, never be the same again. The Lord revealed unto Nebuchadnezzar things to come. Things that were coming. Let the Lord be so close to you and you so close to the Lord. Intimate with the Lord that the Lord be Revealing his might unto you. Revealing his might unto you. And when the Lord reveals his might unto you, tell the Lord, you don't want any confusion to remain. Any problem to remain. Any dimness of sight to remain. You want the revelation to be so clear. You will not even need an interpreter like Nebuchadnezzar. The mind of God clear unto you. The purpose of God clear unto you. The plan of God clear unto you. The decision, the desires of the Lord clear unto you. Revealed himself to Abimelech in a dream, to Jacob in a dream, to Joseph in a dream, to Solomon in a dream, to those wise men in a dream, to Paul in a dream, to Joseph in the New Testament in a dream. He's revealing his mind to his people today. Even to Nebuchadnezzar, even to Pharaoh, although they didn't hear interpretation, but the people of God, when God reveals Himself, it's so plain, so clear. Tell the Lord you don't want any confusion in your mind, any dimness of sight in your spiritual life. You want to see things so clear, so plain. 
the paths that you are treading. You want to see the pitfall so clearly. You don't want any confusion. And what the Lord wants to do in your life, through your life, you want to see it very clearly. Oh Lord, reveal yourself unto your people. God speaks to people. God reveals his mind to people. He is a father. He wants his children to know his thoughts, his mind, his way, his word, his will. Jesus said, I call you not servants anymore, for the servants do not know what what their master's plan. I call you friends because everything I've heard of my father, I reveal unto you. Why don't you tell the Lord, reveal your mind, reveal your heart, reveal your way, reveal your will, reveal your word unto me. I don't want to keep on walking in darkness, living in darkness, living in confusion. Make your way clear. Make the path clear. Make your thoughts clear. Make your plans clear. Make your operations and dealings clear in my life. Tell the Lord you don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. Afraid of God's word. Afraid of God's mind. Afraid of God's leading. Afraid of God's revelation. You don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. Afraid of the revelation of the Almighty God. You don't want to be forgetful like Nebuchadnezzar. Hearing and forgetting. Seeing and forgetting. Hearing and forgetting. Learning and forgetting. You want the word of God to be real, fresh, well known, remembered in your life. You want to be able to recall what the Lord has taught you, what the Lord has revealed to you. You want to be able to recall at the time you need it. You don't want to be a forgetful hearer like Nebuchadnezzar. It's what we remember that gives us the victory. It's what we remember that gives us the triumph. It's what we remember that makes us more than conquerors. Pray that you'll not be like Nebuchadnezzar. That has the revelation of the Almighty God, and then at the time he wakes up to now live in the experience of that revelation is forgotten. And pray that God will help you not to shift your problems on other people. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Shifting the responsibility of recalling the dream to other people. He didn't know God in a personal way. So he wanted other people to recall what he could not recall. To remember what you could not remember. Pray that God will make you a responsible believer. A responsible man. A responsible woman. That will not cheat your responsibility on others. You will not be blaming others for your forgetfulness. Blaming others for your yokes, for your problems, for the things you should take to the Lord in prayer by yourself.
pray that God will help you to overcome the anger of Nebuchadnezzar. Be thoughtful, be wise. Anger destroys the angry man. Anger walks against the interest of the angry man. You hurt yourself with your anger more than you hurt other people. Whenever your demands are not realized, your expectations not fulfilled, anger is not the solution. Pray that the Lord will make you free from anger in your family. Free from anger in your interactions with people. Don't rely on them. Rely on God. When you rely on people, you get disappointed. You get frustrated. And you get angry. And the anger does not solve your problem. It compounds your problem. Put it off. Like you put off a dirty garment. Put it off. Pray that God will give us wisdom. The kind of wisdom he gave Daniel. And for the grace of his lips, the king was his friend. And the concession that the king will not give to the other people, the wise men of the land, that same concession, the Lord gave, the king gave unto Daniel. For the grace of his lips. Pray that God will give you such wisdom, such gentleness, such winsomeness. And then he had faith. Said, King, give me time. I'll come back to you. I'll reveal the forgotten dream unto you. That's faith. And Daniel had companions. Companions in purity. What kind of friends do you have? What kind of companions do you have? Companions in persecution, those who can suffer persecution with you and not give up and not give in. Courageous, bold, uncompromising companions who do not care for pain or pressure. Companions in perseverance. But made up their minds to endure to the very edge. He that shall endure unto the end of him shall be saved. Companions in prayer. Companions in prayer. What kind of companions do you have? Are they people that pray? Or only people that gossip? Only people that complain are your friends. Only people that murmur. Only people that are always backsliding. Companions in prayer. Companions in preaching. This will encourage you not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God 
unto salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Pray that God will help you to have a good influence on your friends, on your companions. Those who take the promise of God at face value. And those who will boldly, courageously stand until the prayer is answered. Those are the good companions. Do you have any prayer partner? Who is your prayer partner? Do you have any preaching partner? Who is your preaching partner? Two are better than one. For if one falls, his friend, his fellow, his companion will lift him up. The wise pray that God will help you that your life will be a meaningful life, a profitable life, a useful life. Only one life to live. Make it a useful life. Don't let Nebuchadnezzar threaten you and move you out of the will of God. If you can pray, and if you would have friends and companions, fellows that know how to pray, your life will be meaningful. Pray that everything you have learned today will contribute to making you more than a conqueror. Through Christ to love you and give himself for you.